have you been making? Excuse me. <laughs> look right, in the, right into the camera for you there at the end. Thought I'd uh, look right in the lens. Case. For a best day go. Aren't you going to ask for my ID? I might not be old enough to drink. Ooh, you having a little trouble? <laughs> <laughs> right. Certainly not old enough to drink, are you? <laughs> Moving on. Charlie Good. I don't seem to be working. <laughs> Putting somebody into hibernation requires. <laughs> <laughs> Android. Oh shit. Completely. I was so happy with myself for doing that. I f***ed it up. Robot control. Data net. Good light. Red light. F it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Green light. Good. Bad light. Red. <laughs> red light. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, made the Venus run a bunch of times. Jupiter, Uranus, you name it. And then along came. I didn't want to. I didn't If Jennifer were rescuing somebody, I would put on this outfit and be like, never mind. You didn't feel like you had a good chance, right? Ash! Chris Pratt, screen test, Thor 4. You're so talented, I feel like I can't even look at you. I know, it's, <laughs> it's like staring into the sun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I've been acting for the past 45 seconds. Yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to try to find something in my real life on which to draw. Okay, I got it. If it's not platinum, it's gold. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> <Are you? laughs> Mark. It's Chinese. It'll be awesome. It'll it is gonna be awesome. Just it's a, what a wealth of what a wealth of entertainment. <laughs> I'll be sucking in my gut on this one. I hope that's cool. Bet you can't do that. Don't eat the milk. That's not what you Tell me if you see too much Bruce Willis in this one, because I'm going to give a little Bruce. Okay. Cool. We want a little bit Bruce, but not. Okay. You don't want to go too Bruce. Yeah. Just a little bit. Okay, we're rolling, rolling. Huh? That's, okay. that's Bobby. Are we, are we set? Set. I'm Bruce. Okay. This is Bruce. <laughs> Ready and... Chris Pratt. You're watching behind the scenes footage. Set of passengers. Hey, I'm Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt is the most passionate person on a movie. Really looking forward to reading the script to figure out what I'm doing up here. <laughs> he is such a kind of enthusiastic presence. He's so into what's going on. Are we shooting this bitch? Oh my God. Mark. 
This was so unlike anything I've ever done before. Working alone for a portion of the movie was a riddle that I wanted to crack. Chris is just a fantastic guy. He's just got this boisterous attitude, happy, making jokes. He just has a lot of energy he brings to every shoot day, everything he does. Oh, Hector, por favor, otra vez. Chris is so funny, and he's confident, and he's quick. A2 microchip. <laughs> it's about 27,000 lights on the floor, about 40,000 lights on either side. So we're looking at upwards of 2.8 billion lights. <laughs> and yet there's that very soulful part of him that comes through as well. That's a hard thing to pull off. Chris makes such a likable and relatable character at the heart of it that you can't help but empathize and go on that journey with him. <laughs> You're funny. For the first act of the movie, I am without anyone else. I found various ways and techniques of getting to those emotional places. I could take big swings, and even if I missed, I felt like I'd be OK. An hour 17 of a, of a 28-hour workday. Then we'll break for lunch. We'll go back for another 31 hours. This is the time okay. when Chris starts wearing my shoes. Yeah. We're working like 18-hour days. We're getting killed on this thing. He is the hardest working person I've ever met in my life and has such an amazing attitude. I burped inside my helmet. Hold your breath when you open my visor. Oh, good God. 15 minutes, my eyes are watering. Chris has so much positive energy and is so supportive and so enthusiastic. Too graceful, huh? I always get that note. I had to tell him to stop being so happy. No, you need to be grumpy. <laughs> it's not so intentional. It's just kind of my personality. I think life's too short, you know? You have to have a positive attitude. Attitude is contagious. It's about gratitude and recognizing people who are working really hard. Chris Pratt, 50 Shades of Grey 2 audition. Something quite childlike that creates a kind of an atmosphere that seeps into everyone. This is all special design. It might be in the movie for one second and someone I just broke it. Don't tell anybody. You're here on season 19 of Dancing with the Stars. Dancing. America, we need your votes. He is by far, in a galaxy far, far away, better dancer than me. <laughs> you did great! OK, one more time. I got a thumbs down. That's ex I did exactly what you just did. But I might be better at basketball. Let's see if those basketball lessons have paid off. That's good. Uh. Close. You want to see me dunk it? Yeah. <laughs> He's not normally like this. On fire. I think you have to feel safe. That's really, for me, the key to really going for it as an actor. Get out of here! Come back. Hey. Wow. It's not about the destination, it's about the journey. A great film that everyone loves is a destination. I think it's gonna be awesome, Morton, and I think you're wrong. Will you fix my makeup, Chris? God, yes. I'll fix everything. Dude, I could do this all fucking day. It's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you read a script and it just grabs a hold of you and does not let go. I was never gonna let anyone else play Jim. I see 5,000 men and women changing their lives for 5,000 different reasons. I found the characters who would be involved in this story intriguing. Humanity's flight to the stars, the greatest migration in human history. It's the biggest story there is. You've got a combination of people working on this. This is Aurora. Aurora. It creates a kind of an atmosphere that I think suffuses the film. It's very rare that you find yourself in a situation where you're playing with a minimal amount of people in a cast in a huge, vast, almost infinite space. I think we were very fortunate to have Chris because he combines a wonderful comical acuity, but he also has a very deep soul as a person and as an actor. Chris just has such a warmth and such a humorous side of him that he gives you this every man feel going through this experience. Maybe I missed something. I could use a hand. That's all. Message will arrive in 19 years. Wait, what? Earliest reply in 55 years. That will be $6,012. Chris is very different than Jim. That was interesting to watch him go from Chris Pratt to this shy, insecure, 
person. I'm sorry. I think I may be Hold in the wrong. Hold all questions till the end, please. Oh, sorry. There's a lost masculinity to his character in a world where you throw away everything that doesn't work. Like if your car breaks down, you can't fix it anymore. If your iPad doesn't work, you buy a new one. He is almost becoming obsolete and an outsider in the world where he needs to fix something. It's a caring, nurturing masculinity that wants to build things. Why did you do it? Do what? Immigrate. Leave Earth. I'm interviewing you. Aurora is a more intellectually realized person than Jim. She's this career woman who's conquered Earth, essentially. Now she's going off to conquer another world. Aurora is very smart and very driven and curious. What about research articles, any kind of technical documents? Hibernation technology is proprietary. In Jennifer Lawrence, we had just a gorgeous, naturally athletic person who feels like an icon of femininity and a shrewd, acutely intelligent performer. We're sitting there having a conversation, me and Jennifer, and they're like, okay, Jennifer, we need you on set. She just turns it on. Fifteen seconds ago, she was sitting next to me talking about what we had for dinner last night, and now she's out there doing it. She's just incredible. Merci beaucoup. That was so good. Well, it wasn't easy getting a reservation. <laughs> In the weirdest way, I feel like being trapped was what Aurora finally needed. Aurora would have always struggled to settle down with somebody because she would have always been doing what she's always doing with life and with work, always looking around the corner to see what's coming next. Why are we here? You see. If they weren't on the ship, she would have never given him a chance. Okay. She would have done what we all do in our heads and looked at the checklist and, oh, this is missing, this doesn't work. Is he asking me on a date? I'm not like Aurora, where being trapped would calm me down. I would be like a bumblebee on a window, bumping against it. This time, this time, this time. What really makes this special is this relationship between the two of them and the emotional journey that they go on together. How long have you been awake? A year and three weeks. She's got empathy for him and his situation, which is exactly what he probably wants. If you're struggling and suffering to such a severe degree, what you want is somebody else to recognize the pain that you've gone through. The minute she does, he feels terrible because he knows that he's betrayed her. For a minute, I almost forgot my life is in ruins. Sorry. What for? Playback. Chris and Jennifer are gifted artists. I can't say enough about how brilliant both of them are individually and collectively together. Every time the two characters are apart, you want them to be together. It's a very unique couple. That heat and that chemistry between the two of them is exceptional. Each actor over the course of their career gets one great love story. And I think that for both of them, this is it. How's your day been? Aurora's awake. Congratulations. Arthur is programmed to be the greatest bartender ever. He's able to have conversation. He's able to make a fantastic martini. I envy you, Arthur. How so? You have a purpose. How's your book coming along? He's a good listener, great for topical conversation, but it's really just something that's imitating a human instead of having to deal with robots. What's fun for me to explore as the character is how human-like he can be and how much you can forget that he's android. Say you were trapped on a desert island. I've never been on an island. And then suddenly you hit a kind of a strange wall where you're suddenly reminded, oh no, this is not a human being. Let's say you figured out how to do something that would make your life a million times better, but you knew it was wrong. Jim, these are not robot questions. In a way, Arthur's a tease. Ultimately, there's nobody in there. At the same time, just as Jim's awakening is an unprecedented event in space travel, having someone hang around the bar this much is an unprecedented event in Arthur's life. So, I know. Because obviously there's usually thousands of people coming in and out of the bar, and he does what a normal bartender would do, but in the events of the film, he suddenly goes into new territory because he's interacting with one person for a very long period of time. He's never gotten to know anybody this well. Over the course of the story, Arthur grows a little bit. He 
begins to improvise. You see him starting to learn to tell jokes. I laughed at the man with no pants until I realized I have no legs. <laughs> but you also see him making really terrible mistakes. In many ways, he's like a child. He tries to understand what goes on between the two grown-ups. Jim was so looking forward to meeting you. What? How could he be looking forward to it? Oh, he spent months deciding whether to wake you up. It doesn't come from a malevolent agenda. It comes from a sort of innocent attempt to pick up on what's going on. Did you wake me up? It's like they be having a divorce and he's the child which they have split custody over. Tuesday's my day with Arthur. Ours all yours. At the same time, he gives the wisdom. You know, he's programmed to give like bartender cliches. You're not where you want to be. You feel like you're supposed to be somewhere else. <laughs> a lot of the themes of the story comes from him. You can't get so hung up on where you'd rather be that you forget how to make the most of where you are. He's a consummate pro. Actors like Michael, it's very specific, well thought out, and you see it and it's just, it's perfect and it's right. You can really learn a lot working with somebody like that, and I, I think I did. That was good. Gus comes into this story like a messenger, here to tell you that times are changing. Who did that? I did. Gus is the adult. He's the father figure in this piece. Uh, action. Don't touch anything. Aurora and Jim, they're grown-ups, but they're also, in a strange kind of way, adolescent. Unauthorized personnel. Sorry. Lauren Fishburne brings such authority and, at the same time, humanity to this character. Gus is a guy who fell in love with the stars and the notion of interplanetary travel at a young age and has made probably five or six voyages to different planets. So technically, he's five, six hundred years old. He's the sailor who's always been traveling. The space becomes the sea. Years ago, people were moving out of their own countries and going across the world and discovering new places. Gus is that kind of guy. Jim and Aurora don't really understand the gravity of the situation until Lawrence Fishburne's character is introduced. So you know what Jim did? Yeah. And? Lawrence, Jen and I are both massive fans. It was really thrilling to get to work with him. There's another great example of somebody that you can learn a lot from. He's just a terrific actor and terrific guy. How long were you alone? A year. Damn. Ready, and action! Each person that was cast in this film, whether it's Jen, Chris, Michael, or Lawrence, is perfect. They're all some of the finest actors working, period. For me, it just made it a treat. It was a beautiful experience because we all were so passionate about it. It was definitely a challenge, but I was thrilled to try it out. artists working on this movie. With visual effects, we wanted to go more elaborate, more immersive, and more beautiful. It's only gonna, you know, suture everything together and make it feel that much more real. We really put a lot of time and effort into creating an amazing visual world that is inviting but awe-inspiring as well.
we have these big action moments that happen outside the spaceship. A key challenge for us was how to deal with the fact that we have Jim tumbling through space. So we figured out a way to surround him with these LED panels that will then provide us with an interactive light. The LED box is comprised of over 600,000 LEDs and mechanically all the LED bolts together and we can basically use it as building blocks to create any type of structure to fit the scene. It's that brightness that we're trying to get. None of this content actually matters because it'll all be redone by us in visual effects. But what we want is that interactive light. The trick is, if you lose one bulb, the whole thing goes out. So we've lost a lot of time yeah, checking each light. In this scene, Chris is tumbling backwards. So he's actually floating on wires. And we tumble the content backwards to mimic him tumbling through space, which is in itself very disoriented. Here I am, and within two seconds, I'm already completely dizzy. I have no, I have no idea if I'm falling over or not. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to walk out of there. <laughs> when Chris first stood in this rig that we built, he was completely sick because it really was that immersive for him. We actually want to feel like the camera is in the same world as him, so the audience is experiencing that same sense of vertigo. And the, the only way we can do that is to actually have the world spin around him. He is stationary, the camera is stationary, and all of that beautiful interactive light that's on his face and on his suit, and all the shadowing and the colors that are changing, that it's moving quite quickly, that's all really souls with this technology that's behind me here. One of the sequences that I'm most excited about is when the gravity shuts off. We get to see it through all of these different points of view. The rig that we're using today is an arm that I had designed a long time ago in a couple of other movies. It's basically this spinning ring that's an extension of a piece of speed rail with a counterbalance weight on the back of it. And what happens is Chris is able to move himself freely throughout space, and then we actually motivate him on a computerized winch system. We fly him back and forth, and he has to motivate himself and act as well as making this look like it's zero G. I have worked with Garrett Warren on a few projects before. This is the first time we've actually been able to do an outer space zero gravity movie. And it's definitely one of the more challenging things you can do in stunts. But he's able to use these rigs and really, if you just ignore the equipment that's being used and just see the body floating, you really get the sense that they're floating through. And it's not easy to accomplish. The weightlessness stuff is really difficult to nail. Without being in a zero gravity situation, you're really trying to fake the idea that gravity's not pulling down on your hands or down on your feet, and you're suspended simply by your belt. So you're doing a plank in, in midair. It's some of the best ab workouts I've ever done. I mean, like I kind of want to get a wire rig at my home gym. This rig is really hard to do. I mean, if you aren't physically fit, you can have a hard time. They got me floating in this space suit. This is kind of cool. The space suit is real heavy, probably about 80 pounds or 100 pounds. It takes 45 minutes to put on or take off. And we're hanging on these suits, and each boot weighs 20 pounds, and my helmet weighs another 40 pounds. And they're saying, ah, oh, it doesn't look like you're weightless. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not. First of all, I weigh a lot, but these boots weigh a lot too, man. It's some of the best zero-G work that I've ever done on a film. The fact that he was able to do it himself and not just a stunt person really does speak volumes about Chris. It's really difficult, but I feel like I'm cut out for that type of work, especially the physical stuff. I get mentally exhausted way before I get physically exhausted. <laughs> not to brag, but uh, my brains are in my glutes, bro. One of the things that happens was that the gravity goes out and Aurora almost dies in the pool. It's a turning point in the movie, and I think it's a roller coaster. I think it's super fun. That was probably the hardest thing I've ever shot, but it was really amazing. When I saw the CG example of what it was going to look like, I was really excited. I would argue it's probably the most technical sequence for us in the whole film because it's dealing with digital water. The place that we've shot, we feel really good about. Jen was great, and we have a substantial amount of practical photography of her in water. Trying to get Jennifer to feel like she's floating in zero gravity within the pool 
was a whole other thing because you're, you're battling different forces of physics. There's the water that has its own entrapment and in, in, in physical em, embodiment, but then there's also her floating with the water and floating a little bit out of the water. And so they were able to use this underwater rig that can kind of move her up and down within it, but also give her the ability to still be floating. And we have that sort of floating, almost embryonic shot against the stars to remind us how fragile everything is. We're lucky enough to have a lot of great reference because on the space station, they have begun to do a lot of tests with what water does do. And the thing we're discovering is it's completely supportive of what we think water is gonna do in space. So the key moment in that sequence for us, when we know we've done our job, is if the science behind what water does do in zero gravity feels real. The movie's very visually interesting because these two people are trapped. The visuals are so large, they're so lost in this giant space that's so much bigger than them. I think we've done our job well if at no point do you feel as though you're being brought out as a result of the magnificence of what is in front of you. It's amazing to see what goes into making this movie. It's a massive undertaking. You realize there's been people putting in thousands of hours of work to make this look the way it looks. The Avalon is part badass spaceship and part luxury cruise liner. We have a script that's all about isolation and their sort of mental state about being alone. And so immediately you have a spaceship that needs to be enormous, basically the equivalent of the Titanic in space. Everything was very beautiful. It just looked very different to me than anything I've seen before. Ideas. My production designer, all we wanted to work with, and who you designed this, this phenomenal spaceship. These ideas were extremely exciting. There was a very strong identity to the look of the ship that was commercial and a little less techy. Was really nice. The other thing that was very interesting about the process that I think ultimately helped the boldness of the design was the very compact and limited time frame we had to put all of this together. We would have traditionally four months, five months of just pure thought process, pure development of the design. We got on this film with Morton. He was raring to go. And we basically had 10 weeks before we were building. We did not have the luxury of going and finding sets someplace that we could just walk into and shoot on. There were no starships lying around to borrow. Virtually every place you see in the film was real and physically built. Grand Concourse. This ship is really luxurious. It's like a cruise liner almost. The sets were really amazing and huge. The main set, which is called the Grand Concourse, looks very much akin to a very high-tech shopping mall. All the restaurants feel very much like slightly weird and wonderful restaurants that you might find in any city. You have a Japanese restaurant. Does that seem fishy to you? <laughs> a French restaurant. Merci beaucoup. A Mexican restaurant. Hector, por favor, otra vez. Si, señor. Gracias. Everything is set on one ship entertainment centers with dance machines, sports centers. Oh! Whoa, whoa, oh! You have a swimming pool, a swimming pool on a spaceship. We had to make sure that the sets gave you a sense of loneliness and of isolation, but at the same time, in a sort of a, a cruel way, almost a very cruel way, feel very happy and very inviting. The Vienna Suite was probably one of the hardest sets. And the reason for that was the very, very difficult challenge of finding the ultimate hotel suite in space. How do you do that? What is that? 
Morn just had that twinkle in his eye and he said to me, I really need the Vienna Suite to be the most modern and fantastic apartment that you would have in New York. And that became the starting point for the Vienna Suite. I think one of the interesting features about the Vienna Suite is its scale and its height. It's a two-story abode, and you would walk in. There's sort of the lounging area. There's a dining area. And of course, the stairs here, which we're very proud of, that look sort of like a strange futuristic musical instrument, those actually go up to the bedroom area. Here we are in the bedroom part of the Vienna Suite. The design and construction of this bed was a labor of love of about five different departments. And although it looks like a very simplistic design, it's an incredibly complicated architectural feat with a cantilevered top like this. And of course, we have this amazing projection screen with images of sunrise and aurora borealis and beautiful snow-covered landscapes. That room becomes Jim's sanctuary, and it's so grand in scale, so big in scope. The detail is pretty amazing. What can I get for you? You look like a whiskey man. Uh, OK. I think it's the first time you've ever seen a spaceship with a bar in it. We wanted a ship that doesn't only rely on futuristic elements. We wanted to look back, like inspired by a lot of old movies. I took a chance and pitched to Morton the notion of an Art Deco style bar, sort of typical New York Art Deco style bar. But obviously, it's 500 years in the future. So actually, it's people's idea of what an Art Deco bar would have been, <laughs> you know, in the 30s. And uh, so you get this slightly heightened reality to everything. The textures and colors of the bar, the golds, the reds, the richness of it was very impressive. It really doesn't fit with the ship at all, and yet it does. You get this wonderful transition from the Grand Concourse into a bar that feels as though you're, you're stepping back in time. The whole kind of Art Deco look of the place, I think, is very evocative of The Shining. When you watch the film, although the bar is very different to The Shining, there are elements of it, and interestingly enough, elements in how Morton has filmed the various scenes that are definitely a tip of the hat to Kubrick. Literally everything in here is custom. Everything here is very specifically tuned to this set. It probably is the set that has taken the longest to put together because of the huge amount of intricate detail that you see around you. the hibernation area where the 5,000 passengers are sleeping. It's an enormous set. This set's about 120 feet wide by about 190 feet long. It's enormous. I was free to think about how the hibernation bay could differ from the regular idea, which is rows and rows and rows of people sleeping in liquid or all the various ideas. And the go-to places for me mentally when I'm processing any design are going to be classic architecture and nature. The pod tree was the idea of collectively keeping eight to ten individuals on a sort of a singular umbilical cord. We're standing in front of one of the typical pods. The whole set has 32 pods, which means we're going to have 32 people dressed in their hibernation gear, lying in these pods so that we can really simulate the scope of this ship. The pod tree also led to a number of other forward-thinking ideas. How do you maintain the idea that you're receiving, for example, vitamin D from the sun? So the central feature of the pod trees were these enormous halo lights. And the idea was that the light would simulate day and night. When we started placing all of these trees in a very large, open, shiny black room, 
it became extremely confusing and you essentially created a maze without having to put up any walls. And so it was important for me to help in providing the environment that would do that, that would confuse the audience, make them slightly unsettled. The thing that I loved about Morton's approach to the design in particular was his boldness. He's challenging me to come up with something completely different and off the charts in terms of our expectations of a science fiction film. The production design was out of this world. You basically dropped into the best situation that you can be dropped into as an actor. It looks fantastic. When I see the sets that the people on this crew have built, I mean, you can't help but be in awe. I'll forever be impressed by the magnitude of this type of a movie and this type of a set. Level one, repeat after me. Yana Chinew. Ya is a chat ruski. Priest Krasna, my drug. Eta paestinia krezavoya zig. You speak Russian? We have Russian passengers. Well, I'm trying new things. From now on, Arthur, every time I sit down, I want a drink I've never had before. Fair enough. Ooh. What is that? Something new. Get out of there! Come back, hey. Come here. <laughs> A tua! Drug moi, eu devia me ter. Sajalinho. What? Make me a new drink. There are no new drinks. What do you mean? I can make 1,436 cocktails. You've had them all. Just no new drinks. There's no new drinks. There's no way we're going to build a hibernation machine. No. And there's no magic sleeping pills in the infirmary. No. You like tacos? It's Tuesday. Jim Preston, who are you? Me? Yeah, I'm gonna be seeing you around. I should know who I'm talking to. I'm from Denver. Musician, lumberjack, serial killer. No, I'm not. I'm not a musician. <laughs> I'm a lumberjack serial killer. <laughs> On the immigration forms, I'm listed as a rate two mechanical engineer. I fix things. Robotics, transport, industrial systems. A little bit of everything. Wow. I'm not nearly that useful. I'm a writer. What kind of a writer? Social commentary, long form essays, investigative stuff. A real New York journalist. <laughs> yeah. Did I say I was from New York? It was on your pod. Oh, right, yeah. I never really stay in any place too long, but I always go back to New York. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Give me a cup of coffee and a view of the Chrysler building and I can write all day. Do I have something on my face? Stay.
staring at you. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. You just spent over a year with nothing but robots. I don't know how you did it. They're all such idiots. Yeah. Well, not all of them. Evening, Jim. Arthur. Who's the lovely lady? This is Aurora. Aurora, this is Arthur. Aurora. A pleasure. Very nice to meet you, Arthur. What'll it be? I'll have a dirty martini, please. This is a robot I can talk to. Android, technically. Oh. Whiskey soda. It gives you no warning. Suite's control center is rebooting. You have a call. Answer. You're awake. Yeah. Me too. I've been doing some thinking about you and me and drinking. Thinking and drinking. Do you think if we were on Earth that I would ever even look at you? No. You think that I wanted you? You think that I loved you? I was lonely, Jim. I was bored. Chief Mancuso, good to see you again. Good to see you too, Arthur. Uh, the usual, please. Me too. Me too. The Avalon's made five interstellar trips. I've made all five of them. I've never seen anything more serious than a burnt piece of toast, and now this. Five trips? You know, when I was 16 years old, I lied about my age. Got work on a lunar shuttle crew. I made the Venus run like a hundred times. Saturn, Jupiter, you name it. And then along came the Ion Drive. Hey, you talking about real space flight there. I did whatever I had to to get on board an interstellar ship. So I was 35 years old when I saw my first alien son. There was no turning back after that. That's incredible. Didn't you ever feel homeless? No, I'm a spacer. My home is where I am. You have yourself. What you do, company you keep. <clears throat> oh, I guess I woke up kind of hard. You should get some rest. Yeah, just a couple of hours and back at it in the morning. Tomorrow, you two work for me. Arthur. Oh, 
stranded on a starship. Gravity loss means that whatever's wrong is starting to hit the big ticket items. Not good. Two in the red, one dead. If it's dead, why is the gravity back on? Everything in the ship is a network. One system goes down, others take up the slack. But then they're working too hard, and eventually they'll go down too. Placement's down here for just about everything. Every failure is a burnt out process. Everything on board is thinking too hard. Why? Got it. You're a pro. Rate two mechanic. 